KC Laboratory. Sponsored by Emprise Bank. It's the KC Laboratory presented by Emprise Bank. Look, nobody loves to bank. They love what banking can help them achieve. And Emprise Bank is looking to say yes to those with a dream. Whether it's saving for your first home, a new car, starting a family, starting a business, uh, continuing with KCSN Draft Guide, Emprise is your partner in possible. That's Emprise Bank, member FDIC. Absolutely wonderful to work with. Uh, you, If you're in the KC area, wherever you're at, they are absolutely worth uh, checking out for your banking needs. Uh, I'm here with my dear pal, Maddie Lane. We are uh, we are without Craig tonight, but uh, we'll probably have Craig back soon. Craig's fine. Actually, no, Craig's not fine. Craig is great. What's up, Maddie Lane? Uh, you know, I'm doing well. I like that you corrected course there because the Renaissance man is, is, is not good. He's not fine. He is absolutely great. He will be back and better than ever once he gets through his latest experiment. Um, so here we are. In the the almost the heat of the offense, like it feels like the dead period of football is approaching very quickly. But I don't even know if we're there yet. Like it's still May. I don't even that's know. What's if this scary? Counts. That's yeah, what's that's scary. A, that's what's I, I don't even know if this counts as the dead period yet. And it feels like we are there. Like it feels like as much as there's like you know the whole thing of the NFL stays relevant 365 days, which is true. Like there is stuff that comes out. It's just not everything's going to pertain to your favorite team. And we are we are hitting this a huge lull right now. It seems like for the Chiefs, and you still got the two worst months of the year for that to come. This is why I'm like always just trying to cut these episodes in half and save one of your great ideas for an episode in June, Maddie. Like, I hey, I save the wild off the wall ideas for then. I only bring things that are time relevant to the table. Well, uh, we uh, yeah, there was one. There was like one a couple weeks ago. I was like, man, that could have been a whole that could have been a whole episode in June. <laughs> uh it's okay we're gonna make uh we're gonna we're gonna find some stuff to talk about throughout the off season we will do our season preview as we do every year and i'm sure there's some other stuff that will come up some chiefs related news and this is it well we're gonna start this off the top there's there's some not really chiefs related news but sort of james bradbury is off the market signing with the philadelphia eagles on a one-year 10 million dollar deal with 7.25 million dollars guaranteed so one of the guys that we kind of discussed a little bit last week sitting up there at the thresholds um you know that we kind of laid out we said hey you know four or five million dollars guaranteed with some incentives to get it up to eight seven eight he got 7.25 guaranteed Guaranteed. so i mean i think you know i feel fine with the you know i I was kind of you know more in favor of james bradbury joining the chiefs at that price point like if if the the chiefs today announced a 10 million dollar one-year deal with a 7.25 million dollar guarantees how do you feel matthew I i would be upset it's well over the limit that i think that we kind of all set for what we would want to pay somebody like james bradbury and the issue with it is when you're going to pay a guy up to 10 million dollars but you're setting the baseline roughly at 7.25 because that's what he's getting like that's a starter that guy's not competing for a starting job he's not you know, in the mix, he can't really lose it. That's a lot of money on a one-year deal for a guy that does have some level of pedigree. You're signing him to 100% be your starter, and there's a chance that James Bradbury is fine again. There's a chance he returns to his form from 2018, 19, even 2020, but there's also a chance that that guy that I saw last year on the film that was literally afraid to run is still there and arguably even worse. And if that's the case, you're still having to start him because the amount of money you're giving them, you're now stalling out any development from some younger guys that might play or be here longer. Like I just don't see Bradbury's ceiling is very high based on what we've seen most recently from him. And then you add in that much money. It would just, it would concern me a lot. Had the chiefs made that move. So I, I am super happy. They were not the team to pull that trigger. I also do think it makes a little bit more sense for Philly than it does the Chiefs in the situation, given just like looking real quick at each team's roster. It's just I am I am happy they did not go that route. The only thing is like the one thing I think about with all this is like this late in the year, you've got a little cash to spend. Is it like what 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 opportunities are you missing out on if you if you pay a little bit more than you'd want, if you overpay a little bit for a veteran? That's like my only pushback, but it's not a very big one. You know, like I, <laughs> I think it's I, enough money though that I can make the argument that rolling it over to next year matters. Like it's sure. not so insignificant that I mean, essentially, would I rather pay 
Bradbury this year for $10 million or would I rather pay somebody else $10 million next year? Like it's enough money that I don't think that it's, that, you know, you just kind of have to spend it, I guess. But I, right. I get what you're saying. Like they are, you're getting pretty close to having an excess amount of money without really anything to do with it. And for a team that is not playing only the long game, that is a bit interesting. 100%. And it, that's why it's just fascinating, like to see this team have as much money as they have at this point. It's like, you know, I mean, they've obviously like they're, they're, they're committed to building through the draft this year. It's just interesting that they've got so much more money than they normally do. And I just keep waiting for them to do something that isn't as long term focused, if that makes sense. Like it just, I keep waiting for them to do something a little bit more on the, you know, hey, let's trade for Robert Quinn. Hey, Let's spend a little bit money on Jadavian Clowney. Like I keep waiting for some move that's a little bit more short term minded, and it just doesn't keep. It doesn't happen. It's not happening. So it's interesting. Like the full on commitment to you know uh, their their uh, philosophy seems to like is, it might it might work itself all the way through you know to to the season, and that's just I think that's interesting. There's no rush on it now, though, right? Like once you get past, I guess, the draft and like maybe this first little weekend or week after the draft, there's no longer a rush to make sure that you get that guy right now. Like what is a veteran player going to be missing? You know, part three or whatever of OTAs or something like that. Like I, I guess they're just not missing anything. You're not up against any time frame right now for any moves. So like that's why I'm kind of like just okay with waiting it out. But I'm with you. Like it seems like there's one more like more immediate impact move that should be coming right around the corner for the chiefs. This Bradbury situation kind of seemed to align perfectly for them to do that. I think that they would rather get a defensive lineman. You just heard them talk a lot more about a defensive lineman. So maybe that is it. Maybe they are just kind of holding on till June 1st or, you know, to see who all is going to be available then and maybe try to make a move. Then like I said, there's just no timetable forcing to make a move now. And that's another issue with the dead period is you have literally no deadlines that matter for the next three months. And I, I think, you know, it's worth, it's worth being patient too. Like there's some, there's some virtue in being patient with this too, because you know, there will inevitably be some, be some guys that become available between now and the start of the season, you know, and <laughs> I think it, it benefits the chiefs to have a little bit more flexibility to be able to handle those uh, as they come. And, you know, it, that, I think that's part of one of the philosophies. We talked about this a little bit, you know, um, last week or maybe it was even Monday. It's just like Veach has done a good job of of staying disciplined with certain guys the last couple, you know, couple years. It seems like they're they're willing to draw lines and the byproduct of that could be having some flexibility in the future to be able to be a little bit more aggressive with some guys that they like. So I'm very interested to see, you know, what happens at the end of the offseason if there's some you know, you know, early preseason, you know, guys that become available. If there is some, uh, you know, some some trades that become available, uh, or or some guys that get released in June, it's going to be worth watching. Oh, uh, okay. So we kind of got the James Bradbury stuff out of the way. Um, turning the page, and one of the things we kind of want to look at today is, you know, it drafts not too far away, but we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about the draft as a whole for other teams. And the, we wanted to look at the AFC West a little bit today and just kind of talk about the drafts um, that the that the AFC West opponents had. Um, you know, some of them had some restricted draft capital. We'll start with the Denver Broncos. They didn't All have a them. pick until, yeah, they didn't have a pick until pick 64. Uh, but I think they did pretty good for themselves uh, in this draft. All things considered with the draft capital they had. I really liked their first three picks. Um, Nick Benito, uh, pass rusher out of Oklahoma at pick 64 is their first pick. Uh, at pick 80, Greg Dulcich, uh, at the tight end out of UCLA, UCLA, a guy that we talked a lot about here on the, on the, you know, the KCSN draft coverage. Uh, and then Damari Mathis, the cornerback out of Pittsburgh, a guy, I think we said that we bet sticks, I think at one point as well. So, yeah, uh, I think th that was a really strong draft with pick 64, 80 and one fifteen. I think that's a pretty strong group to get. Um, you know, what do you thought? What's your, what's your thoughts on that group, Maddie? Yeah, I, I think it's a pretty good group for kind of given what they had to operate with, right? Like Nick Benito was never going to be, I guess, a guy that fits for every team. There's going to be certain teams that are going to rule him out because they don't know. There's not enough experience, you know, film of him as playing an off ball linebacker. So now you're dealing with a really small guy that doesn't have a lot of length to play. Maybe as a off ball Sam linebacker, maybe as a stand up three, four edge rusher, 
So like Benito kind of being the top of your class doesn't look super strong, but then you kind of look at the way they're trying to function with their defense with, you know, they got some pass rush with Bradley Chubb and then across from him, Randy Gregory, Nick Benito kind of slots in is a pretty good backup to somebody like Randy Gregory, similar ish body type, similar ish skill set. So you can kind of use him as that speed rusher coming out of, you know, on dime or nickel reps and stuff like that. So like, I thought that was an interesting pick. I thought it was a good value <coughs> at 64. I love the value of Dulcich at pick 80, but the thing is they kind of already have a similar type of player. This move tight end, they can semi-function as an inline blocker and Albert O. And so I'm very intrigued to see what the move is to stack an offense with tight ends for Russell Wilson, who notoriously hates throwing the tight ends because he can't (laughs) see to the middle of the field. Yeah, I think it might have just been one of those things where they were just letting the value fall to them. And that's probably a smart play when you've got restricted draft capital. And I think that's something I, I could see George Payton subscribing to something like that, too. You know, um, so, I mean, I think they, they let value fall to them. And I think they got good value with the first two picks of their draft. And I, like Greg Dolchus, we talked about him in round two as a target yeah. for the Chiefs. And Nick Bonito, I know he's got a lot of love and, you know, he wound up going to the last pick a day you know, of round two. But like if, if you told me he went 15 picks earlier, I wouldn't have been stunned either. So, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah, they, they didn't have a glaring need at tight end, but maybe they just love the value of a guy like Greg Dulcich. And, you know, he can maybe flex, maybe, maybe they think they can flex him out a little bit, um, <laughs> similar to what the Chiefs do or you know, try to give him some some matchup opportunities and have, you know, <laughs> Russell Wilson throw some of those YOLO balls outside to a big target like Greg Dulcich. Damari Mathis, I mean, I, I think that's a nice little nice little quality swing there too. I think that's about the right range, about the right value for him at corner. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think, you know, his athleticism could pair in very well kind of with the way that defense is structured usually. So that that'll be an interesting guy worth watching. It's not so much even like for me, the next kind of takeaway isn't a specific player, but rather the fact that they didn't address kind of linebacker or tackle at all. And I think that was pretty two pretty popular positions for a lot of people to assume that they were going to go with. So like right now they kind of have Billy Turner to be slotted to be their starting right tackle. And like, I'm cool with that. I think Billy Turner is a decent right tackle, but it just seemed like you would want, seeming he's on a one year, almost, you know, not quite a vet minimum, but a very palatable one year deal. You think you'd want to bring in some kind of competition for him at the right tackle spot. And then inside linebacker, they're looking at, you know, Baron Browning and Josie Jewell again, roughly is probably what they're going to be looking at. Like that's not, a super strong group. So like, I was kind of surprised that they did not address those two positions. I think you could have put up there as some of their weaker ones, but overall, I think they did a pretty good job with the the draft capital that they had heading into, you know, the draft and coming out with, I don't know if they even got a a single starter, but at least, you know, three guys, maybe four guys that'll fit into the rotation pretty early on. Yeah. Uh, I I think they did, you know, and obviously like their, their draft capital is, is suppressed and reduced because they traded for Russell Wilson. They finally have a quarterback. Uh, were there any day three guys outside of Damari Mathis that really interested you that they took? I know a lot of people like Matt Henningsen, uh, defensive tackle out of Wisconsin. I didn't get it. I don't see it. I did not think he played particularly well in the games that I've watched actually like I really don't get that one but I know he's got some major fans out there so he's one worth watching they're gonna slap him probably at the end and that three four let him play the run they're hoping they literally get uh Derek Watt or not Derek not Derek Watt but uh Derek Wolf 2.0 is kind of the essentially what they're going for there uh I just don't know if he has that same level of mentality and juice so we, we'll see Fayon Hicks though his teammate a cornerback out of Wisconsin In some limited opportunities, I know he tested really well. Some limited opportunities, I think he did make some really nice plays on the ball. I also saw him get beat a lot, so it's kind of like a feast or famine. It'll be interesting to see if he can develop into something and get more consistent at the NFL level. All right, let's look at the Las Vegas Raiders. No, 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 you got to grade this draft. Oh. you. I need this. I need you to grade the Denver Broncos draft on a scale from Patrick Mahomes to Derek Carr only using AFC West quarterbacks. You make things so hard. (laughs) Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I give it a Russell Wilson. Uh, okay, so the th- you think it's the third best draft, roughly? Of the- yeah, I think okay. it's like the third best draft. I give it. A, I give it a solid Russell Wilson, just like their quarterback. It's perfect. The pairing is absolutely perfect. This this trend actually might hold up really well for this game <laughs> because we're gonna go and look at the Las Vegas Raiders 
uh, with the worst quarterback in this con- in this division. And they definitely had some suppressed assets um, as well. They had a restricted amount of assets. They traded for Devontae Adams to make sure they went and grabbed him. Their first pick wasn't in p- in p- until pick 90. Uh, the Broncos made two picks before the Raiders made a pick. Uh, they went with Dylan Parham, the offensive guard out of Memphis, as the only pick in the top 100. They went with two running backs, Zamir White at 122 uh, and Britton Brown at 250. So they went two. They went two running backs uh, at 126 defensive tackle, Neil, uh, 175 defensive tackle, Matthew Butler. Uh, and then at 238, offensive tackle Thayer Munford. Uh, just a weird draft for me. And uh, and they didn't make a single pick with one of their original selections. They were all over the board. They like they didn't make a single one of their like traditional picks. I don't understand this draft. This is uh, Josh McDaniels. I- I'm assuming had a little bit of power in this because this reads off like a New England Patriots draft 100. percent Yep. It's just some some boring guys, some boring guys that play in the trenches. They get some running backs in there, guys that don't particularly have great athletic ceilings, but you kind of see the floor. And then you're just like the thought process when it's the Patriots is, oh no, Bill saw something. He'll know how to fit them in and use them and maximize what they're good at. They'll barely do, ever have to do what they're bad at. And it'll be, you know, okay. Even though he still drafts terribly, like you'll just, it's okay. That's what this looks like. Dylan Parham at 90 is fine, but it's still just a fine interior offensive lineman at 90. I know they need some help there. So like, I don't hate the pick, but I also don't get anything, you know, super fun or exciting out of the pick. Zamir White's a running back. They follow him up in round four. Again, it's a fine running back pick. I think there's some upside there. Like he runs in a similar way to Josh Jacobs. Like I kind of get it. You just get this downhill hammer that maybe has a little bit more athleticism as he gets to be fully healthy followed up by two defensive tackles. It's just, it's a strange draft that you could, I just don't know how you could be excited for it. I don't. And I mean, obviously a little bit about a little bit of that is the, the draft capital itself. I yeah. mean, you know, you don't, you're, it's hard to get excited when, you know, the best pick you have is pick 90, but at the same time, like it just doesn't seem like they, you know, they did much. I mean, dub, there's so much double dipping is so bizarre to me only addressing three positions with your draft is just a weird approach to me because especially since one of those positions is running and you like i mean you spent like not not nothing on a running back i mean pick 122 on zamir white i like zamir white a little bit more than maddie does uh and i think he's a good football player they're not they're not picking up josh jacobs um you know they're not picking up josh jacobs options so maybe there's a little bit of that there but i just yeah overall there's just the just the just just the approach is bizarre. Just taking three positions. It's so Bill Belichickian. Like that's that's all it is. It's just a Bill Belichick style draft that if it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Like like you said, the draft capital wasn't insane. So like, will Dylan Parham, Neil Farrell, Matthew Butler, three of their first, and then we'll even throw Zamir White in there. Like, do I think all four of them were fa- will fail? And they were just these crazy reaches. No, not at all. They were probably all right around you know the value. Which actually, Matthew Butler's good value for where I think we kind of generally yeah. had him. Yeah. But like everyone's at a fine value. It's just like it's a lot of not exciting guys that kind of fill rotational roles for them. They've invested so much in their defensive line recently to go draft two more defensive tackles that are kind of going to be stepping on each other's feet to get out there on the field a little bit. Then you get two running backs that have entirely different skill sets, but like they're still going to be competing with Josh Jacobs and anybody else. And it's just, it is a very odd draft when you try to start to, you know, slot it in with this team. So like you assume that, you know, Parham's going to start at one of these interior offensive line spots or like, that's got to be their hope. And then Zamir, it's not hard. (laughs) It's not. Well, is uh, Alex Leatherwood playing tackle? Or is he playing guard? That's <laughs> what a, are we looking out there? I mean, it's still James or Jermaine Illuminor and Denzel Cut. I mean, they have Kenyon Drake. They have Josh Jacobs. I know these guys aren't long-term guys, but then to come back in and draft two running backs to try to fit in with those two guys and then to add Neil Farrell and Matthew Butler to Vernon Butler, Jonathan Hankins, Andrew Billings. Like, I'm not naming off studs, and none of these guys I think are long-term solutions, but limited draft capital and you're just going to send there and slam the same positions onto this roster of more jag level guys without elite upside it's just it's an odd approach i give it a Derek carr (laughs) 
I think Derek Carr has more excitement to his game than this draft does. I don't even know where I put this. I mean, like, it, you know, on the grading scale, I think you kind of have to give it to Derek Carr, but it's just, it's not. Yeah. It's just, it's weird. Uh, this draft definitely wears eyeliner, you know, this, this is just a, it's a bizarre draft class. This, uh, this draft class is definitely a throwaway on fourth down. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. He's yeah. It's yeah. It's thrown to the flat on, on third and 18, uh, with the game on the line. I don't understand. I'm, I'm on NFL.com right now. I don't understand how this great, this draft got a B, uh, that they gave this great, this grade a B. And like, I understand that a lot of draft grades are going to be, you know, slant towards the positive, but like a B for what we just lifted off seems crazy to me yeah it's i'm not gonna ask you who gave that because then it's gonna seem like i'm dunking no no yeah i don't want to attack him (laughs) was there any position that you thought they would for sure address they did not i just uh i just it's not that uh, maybe a specific position as much as like i thought they would draft more than three positions you know like i think that's you know like i think that's really where you know i think that's where it was for me so that yeah. was just the most bizarre part about it. I, I think they just need to continue to stack talent. And I would have preferred to diversify my swings at certain positions. Well, yeah. And then like in, with that in mind, like, you know, Jonathan Abrams not destined to be there for a long time. They, well, on- they, here's the deal. The entire, that entire draft class had none of, none of them had their fifth year options picked up. Jacob's gone. Uh, Clellan Farrell, gone. Jonathan Abrams, super gone. No, no, it wasn't good. Like, don't get me wrong, but like, I'm, I'm kind of glancing through their, their depth chart. We don't want to go too far into it, but like, I see holes at, you know, depth along the defensive end. I think you could have added some more guys, linebacker, corner, safety. Like, there's not a lot of long term solutions at some positions that you know you might like that you would have likely see mixed in some positions. Even wide receiver, like Demarcus Robinson's like gonna play significant stats snaps for them. And like, I know he has on a Super Bowl winning team. I know he has on a team that just wins the AFC championship game, but like, it's different there. It's just, it's very interesting the way that they decide what positions they decided not to even look at. And then just like hammering multiple offensive linemen, hammering multiple D tackles, hammering multiple running backs. It's just, we said it a numerous times now. I don't necessarily get the approach. It's a very Derek Carian draft. If you were grading him on the AFC West QB grading scale for drafts. Yeah, there's no guys I'm geeked out about or worried about. And like, you know, Greg Dulcich <laughs> in the, in Denver is one like, I'm like, ah, come on. I don't want to have to root against this guy. I don't really care about any of these, you know, guys. Yeah. All right. Los Angeles Chargers are the team that we're going to talk about here. They're the only team with the first round pick uh, that we're going to discuss today. And they went with Zion Johnson, the interior offensive lineman out of Boston College, which like very good football player. I'm okay with them taking a guard. I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of okay with them taking a guard at pick 17. You know, like I, I don't think it's the highest positional value. Uh, I know they're trying to stack a good offensive line around Justin Herbert, but at the same time, like if, if you're picking out ideal scenarios for the, ch- for the chargers at 17, you're, you're hoping they reach for someone crazy or you're hoping them to take a low position like, like guard. Yeah. I think it, I, that caught a lot of people by surprise, right? Like there was, Everyone kind of had them pegged as a offensive tackle to play right tackle in place of Storm Norton or to draft a wide receiver to add a little bit of speed. Now you bring back Mike Williams. You still have Josh Palmer. That's kind of uh, developing there. Oh, they've also signed Maurice French. Chiefs legend. So like, you know, they got some talent in the wide receiver room. You can buy them not having to add extra guys to it. But like those were the two thoughts and they come out and draft a guard. Uh, I do. Are they going to try to move Zion? back out to tackle where he played during 2020 because it wasn't good or i know uh matt eiler who played left guard for them last year has played tackle as like a utility offensive matt in the past. yeah he played guard well for them last year not great but well are they gonna try to move him so zion can they go sit in there next to rashawn slater and give them a solid i just i'm i want to see what their plan is before i really crush the pick but like if the pick is to put zion at right tackle I wholeheartedly do not understand because his tackle tape was rough. Like it wasn't good. And now you're going to ask him to switch sides from where he played tackle at Boston college. And it's just, I don't know. I, I don't love it. Now he has played right tackle in the past at uh, Davidson. They did the whole strong side, weak side, offensive tackle flipping thing. So he's played right tackle before. It's just, it wasn't good when he took a step up in competition. Right. And I, that's why I was just, it's just a fascinating pick. 
you know, we're talking about low positional value. It's good football player. Don't get me wrong. He's going to make him better. I don't know if he's going to make him better the way some other positions possibly could have. You know, like if uh, if the if the if the Chargers had taken Traylon Burks, if they had taken, I mean, there's there's something with Trevor Penning. You know, those are some guys that we're sitting here going, ooh. Those are the next two picks right after Zion Johnson. Like you're probably a little bit more nervous today if Traylon Burks or Trevor Penning is a Charger than you are of Zion Johnson, right? Yeah, I think so. Like I, mean, I think I would definitely lean that general direction. Like I just, he's a very good football player. I think he's very solid. I don't know if I was ever blown away by the potential upside there. Um, and like, like let's say it works out. Let's say he's a guard that is worth this high of a pick, which is pretty rare in general. Like okay, you still just got a guard that was worth the 17th overall pick. Like, right. that's still not a game-altering guy. And the only way it's worth it is if Matt Filer can kick out and play tackle at a competent level. If he can do that, and so you improve left guard and you improve right tackle with one move, then okay, then you can kind of have this conversation about it being worth it. But unless you do that, I just don't know if I necessarily see the path to that being the, the route that I would have gone in that situation. All right, let's kind of look look up and down the board here a little bit more. So they che- they didn't have a second round pick. I believe that was part of the Khalil Mack trade. Yes. JT Woods at pick 79, the safety out of Baylor, a guy that we talked about, you know, or you had talked about as a potential corner convert, Matthew. Yeah. Um, and this I don't know if that's what they'll do. I think the the Brandon Staley kind of gets to be very versatile with his guys. The JT Woods seems like a safety for them, in my opinion. Like just the way their defense is structured, he seems a little bit more like a as a safety. And that's the way I think they'll use him, those three safety sets. I wonder if that means Nasir Adderley maybe isn't coming along at the same rate that they kind of hoped. Moving forward, I don't know, but I like the pick. That was a good kind of spot to take him. He gives them a, a rangy guy with a lot of athleticism on the back end to kind of pair with the rest of the secondary that's really starting to come together. Yeah. They have a good pass rush in front of them. So like, I, I, I like the pick of JT Woods there. I think it was a little bit early based on his film, but I know there's a lot of people that were kind of fans of his projection to the NFL level. Oh, the athletic profile is pretty strong too. Length, physicality, size speed i mean there's there's a lot to like about jt woods with his physical <coughs> sorry his physical profile so i mean getting that guy into that mix um but additionally is i think it's pretty it's pretty solid the isaiah i went with that they went with isaiah spiller at, at pick 123 and like i know that's like your rb3 in this class maybe even like rb1 the way you talk about him in but I go, <laughs> see yeah so like I mean yeah it's, you know like it's it's a fine pick it's, it's a solid pick. pick yeah it's a solid pick there fantastic pick oh really you're you're obsessed with that one is is, is Isaiah Spiller going to be the starter for this team starter is a strong Not word year one but you know what I mean well okay so here's the thing like they got him after Zamir White right so like that's already bonus points right there they got him yeah I take place. Isaiah I take Isaiah Spiller over so Zamir I'm, White I'm just messing around um so. I think it's a good pick. I think he compliments Austin Eckler really well, actually. Like, I think if you go back and look where the Saints kind of come from, or like the head coach or the offensive coordinator for the Chargers and what he was doing with the Saints, it was the one-two punch. You look at when Alvin Kamara was at his best, he had Mark Ingram doing a lot of the dirty work or Latavius Murray or like, you know, whoever. They cycled in bigger bodied guys to do some of the other stuff. That's Isaiah Spiller to Austin Eckler taking more of the Kamara type role. I think that saves his body. It gives them a potential running back to take over in the future if Eckler continues to deal with some, you know, small injury issues that make him miss time. I think it's a good pick. I think he fits in really well with what they are missing. Like when you look at when Eckler's gone down or even when they bring in somebody else, like, you know, Josh Kelly, Larry Roundtree, like these various guys they've had. They think they had a Justin, uh, the Northwestern running back. I forget his name from years ago that has been in the backup. And they're like, they have a lot of guys with similar ish skill sets that don't do anything as good as Eckler, but they try to do it the same way. I think going out and getting Isaiah Spiller, who runs a lot more powerful, a lot more downhill, gives them a differing skill set that I think fits in really well. And if you start building up that offensive line to be a little bit more physical, a little bit tougher, I think you know it kind of slides in well for him there. So I think that was probably my favorite pick that they made. Yeah, I think that was a really solid pick. Uh, Atita Agbanya uh, at pick 160, uh, the defensive tackle out of UCLA. I like that value too a little bit. I think he's a guy we talked about. Maybe the Chiefs, if they're going to address the interior defensive line, that he's a guy that they go grab uh, and stick in the middle of that defense and kind of be like another two-down type player. Big-bodied dude that's good against the run. Um, 
that was, you know, another solid pick. And I think he'll do well in that, in that defensive scheme there as well. So um, addressing that defensive tackle, like, I think there's good defensive. I think there's good value for two down defensive tackles in this draft. And oh, yeah. so and they're the, just going to cycle him in with Sebastian Joseph day and uh, Austin Johnson. And like here, you know, that's a lot of beef to try to run. That's a lot of, you know, good run defenders. Well, we'll see what Otito Ogbonia can do in the uh in the nfl like that wasn't he wasn't used as a run plugger at ucla he was asked to be a penetrator a lot so we'll see how that transitions but like i, I yeah to do it i'm not it worried about another, it it gives them another guy to cycle through right like and i think that's probably smart and they're probably going to move on from jerry tillery and soon because that pick just has not worked out for them mm-hmm. so like that gives them another body there on the interior so yeah it, it made a lot of sense another pick i like jamari sawyer out of georgia i know he's undersized for a tackle but they obviously have no problems with that. See Rashawn Slater. Yeah. Maybe, maybe there's another wild card. Maybe they plan on just having two undersized offensive tackles. And they put try him out at right tackle. That's that's an option that they could go with to pair with that Zion Johnson, or he's just going to come in and compete for one of those guard spots. It's, that's a really good pick there, kind of in the sixth round. I think he's a guy that proved himself versus the SEC, and despite not having perfect physical tools, you know, we kind of saw how Isaiah Wynn has made that work for the Patriots playing left tackle and been completely fine if not better than fine so that was another pick of theirs that i really like kind of later in the draft yeah it was good value down there and i mean a guy that's got a lot of experience playing the sec and national champions played against the best in the best conference like i mean there's worse guys to take swings on down there at the bottom of the roster uh, or bottom of the draft i'm sorry so yeah i give this a solid justin herbert i think this is the second best draft class in the draft uh for the afc west so i mean i think pretty good solid um, well, it remains to be seen if this is enough to slow down Patrick Mahomes, especially since he just got a lot of uh, talent around him with the 10 pits, picks that the Chiefs made. But uh, I think it's weird. Like, we're, if we're ranking like the teams and we're stacking these teams, we paired them literally when we were ranking them with your ridiculous metric. Uh, it's a great metric. <laughs> is it though? Yes, it works perfectly. It literally set up absolutely perfectly. Although I would have given the Chargers also the Russell Wilson. That would have I would have I wouldn't have given it. I thought we did, I thought we couldn't use it again. Who said that? You just assumed rules. Oh, I'll give the Chargers a. It's like a. It's a. It's a Russell Herbert. Mm, so you. So it's early season Russell Wilson. Like it's like the first six weeks. Yeah. Russell Wilson in the first six weeks. Okay. There we go. Yeah, it's like early season Russell Wilson. It's perfect. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Like, I don't I don't think that it's like this clear cut second best class. Um, I actually would say I think Denver's has a little bit more upside and the chance to be better. But the Chargers took some solid guys that I just simply don't think are going to fail. So, yeah, I, I, I think there's two Russell Wilson level drafts. You don't have anybody that's that Justin Herbert nipping on the heels of the Chiefs Patrick Mahomes level draft like you, you know. There's no real Justin Herbert nipping on the heels of Patrick Mahomes. So, I think, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's like the EPA. And then you got the Raiders kind of bringing up the rear and just like this completely confusing draft class that goes right up there with the complete confusing love that like national media has with Derek Carr and thinks every year is going to be his year that he's good. Like, I think this, I mean, you can make fun of my scale all you want, but like it really lined up pretty darn well. (laughs) It wasn't bad. I just hate having to do obscure things that make me think a lot harder. Uh, Next time, I'm going to ask you to rank them by AFC West quarterbacks numbers. You could ask us to do math on the fly like you did that one time. That is going to do it for the KC Laboratory. Thank you so much for listening. We appreciate y'all. We'll catch you later. Be sure to check everything else out going on on KC Sports Network. A lot going on. A lot of exciting things happen. Appreciate our friends at M-Prize Bank. We'll catch you later.